At the end of a war, as the saying goes, to the victor, the spoils. I'm afraid we didn't collect many spoils from the Japanese in Southeast Asia in 1945. Their legacy to us when they'd laid down their arms could be summed up in one word, chaos. Without any interval, no time for cheering, scarcely time to draw breath, in fact, we had to take over and try to sort it all out. Work began immediately, very hard work indeed, of a kind I'd never done before, dealing with a situation which had never existed before, a new force in world history. Liberation came to Singapore and Malaya on September the 12th, 1945. It was already a fact in Burma. Liberation to Southeast Asia meant more than the defeat of Japan. It meant the unleashing of a surge of hope, the stimulation of dreams of nationhood, a new future. All these ideas entered the realm of possibility on the day the Japanese forces made their surrender in Singapore to the Supreme Allied Commander, Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten. For three and a half years, we've had it very rough from the Japanese. They swaggered around in their high jack boots. They beat people up and generally lorded it over us. And here was the supreme moment when not only were we being delivered, more satisfying was the final humiliation of uh, these little warriors who came down with their big swords and uh, long bayonets, frightened everybody in Malaya and Singapore, being made quietly to climb up these flight of steps and really admit defeat. I think it was one of the great moments in history of Southeast Asia. I now find myself in a totally new role. At the end of the surrender ceremony, here in the city hall in Singapore, I ceased to be a fighting commander. The problems I now had to deal with were political and human problems, and on a terrifying scale. And it was impossible to disentangle them from each other. It was as urgent to bring these people food and medicine or, for instance, to repair the drainage system, as it was to work out a system of administration which would meet the needs of the future. I think you all realize, as well as we do, that for the time being, many of the shortcomings and hardships which still exist are inescapable. As a result of six years of world war, there is a world shortage of commodities and worldwide shortage of shipping. So if the material improvement in conditions here in Malaya is slow in coming about, this is entirely due to circumstances of a worldwide nature. Everybody knew that it would never be the same again. In fact, the past was over and people were trying to feel their way to a new relationship. Uh, some thought in terms of uh, home rule, others more ambitious. But whatever it was, everybody knew, both the returning British officers and the local population, that things could never be the same. And probably Lord Mountbatten, by his manner and his style, exemplified the kind of liberal British tradition trying to meet a new human situation with a great sense of anticipation of the history of what is to come in this region. It might have gone the other way, a re-establishment of the old Imperial Raj. But I think Lord Mountbatten, in his breezy naval way, as distinct from the old stuffy colonial governors with their plumed helmets, typified this break with the past. And yet, of course, he, with his uh, royal connections and uh, a member of the senior service uh, of Britain, uh, 
was also part of that same British ruling elite. And my view is I think that made the transition uh, easier probably for the British and definitely for the local people. I was just 45 years old when I took on this great responsibility. Now, from Government House Singapore, I find myself ruling over an enormous area. Before the Potsdam Conference, I'd been responsible for Burma, Malaya and Singapore, Siam and Sumatra. Now, I was also responsible for all the rest of the Dutch East Indies, but French Indochina only up to the 16th parallel. Later, I had to add Borneo and Dutch New Guinea as well, but fortunately, not for long. The original SIAC area was one million square miles. Now, it was one and a half million. It contained 128 million people. There were nearly three quarters of a million Japanese still at large in it. There were 123,000 allied prisoners of war and internees. The whole of this vast area was in a state of utter administrative chaos, and much of it was facing imminent starvation. The reports that poured into me daily here in Government House Singapore were more and more depressing. The presence of the Japanese was one of the most depressing factors throughout Mountbatten's command area. With the world shipping shortage of 1945, nothing like enough was available to carry these defeated armies back to Japan. And so they remained in Southeast Asia, unwanted guests. Uses were found for them. They were put to work, repairing damage, clearing away the distasteful reminders of the time of occupation, when they had been the masters. This was an agreeable sight to those who had endured their rule. But there were other uses of the Japanese that were less agreeable. In fact, grimly ironic. Everywhere the Japanese had destroyed the colonial administrations. British, French and Dutch. They had also bitterly antagonized the local populations who formed resistance groups and guerrilla forces. These now expected to take power. Lawless elements, bandits and dacoits, also perceived their opportunities for loot. Until the British could arrive, and this was no easy matter, the only means of preserving any sort of law and order was the disagreeable one of using the Japanese themselves. This was not good for the Allied image. I knew quite well that the spectacle of Japanese troops and our own apparently cooperating was likely to sap confidence in our intentions. And I didn't like it at all. But there was another reason why I disliked having to do this. It's hard to express how we who'd fought the Japanese came to loathe them. British troops are not good haters. And I'm quite sure they never felt like this about the Italians or even the Germans. Though I dare say the Poles and Russians did. We came to associate the Japanese with sheer inhumanity towards the wounded, towards prisoners, and towards helpless civilians. There were far too many well-authenticated cases of brutality and murder. The Japanese had a habit of bayoneting their captives, and somehow this seemed to make the atrocity worse. And when we discovered in such places as this, Singapore's notorious Changi Jail, or the torture rooms of Outram Road Prison. What they had done to the prisoners they didn't kill, we were even more horrified and revolted. On the very day they accepted unconditional surrender, the Japanese massacred 152 civilians here in Singapore. It was cruelties such as these that caused a number of their leaders to be branded as war criminals. The rescue of prisoners of war and civilian internees from the Japanese prisons and prison camps was the most urgent task of the liberating forces. There were nearly 250 of these camps. 
The first need was to locate them. The second, to rush in medical supplies and food. The third, to get the men out. Thousands had already died of starvation, disease and brutal treatment. By the Japanese military code, a soldier who surrendered had lost his honor and his life was therefore worthless. The Japanese were not concerned with keeping these men alive. Conditions in the prison camps were always bad. In certain areas, terrible. From Sumatra, Lady Mountbatten reported to the Red Cross and St. John, there is no doubt that had the war gone on a few more weeks, there would have been no prisoners of war in these areas left alive at all. They were absolutely at their last gasp. Edwina was superintendent-in-chief of the St. John Ambulance Brigade and chairman of its joint war organization with the Red Cross. She would already had a large hand in the recovery of Allied prisoners of war from Germany, so it would be fair to call her an expert on the problem. When I was in London after the Potsdam Conference, I asked her to come out and deal with it in our part of the world. I really don't know what we'd have done in Southeast Asia without her. I gave her a letter stating who she was and that she was in charge of the advanced arrangements for the recovery of prisoners of war and internees. Armed only with this, she went off everywhere with just a small personal staff, met the Japanese commanders who kowtowed and did whatever she told them. Accompanying Lady Mountbatten on many of these dangerous missions was her private secretary, Mrs. Elizabeth Collins. I joined her in Kandy in 1945, then off to Sumatra where there was much sickness and where the prisoners had to be evacuated as quickly as possible and where Lady Mountbatten directed the major part of the work from the camps. She had to give her orders to the heavily armed Japanese officers who soon realized that here was somebody with the most amazing drive and ability and if she said a thing had to be done, then it had to be. They had thousands of troops covering the areas because she was the first person who arrived in these camps. She worked 16 hours a day non-stop and then started her paperwork in the middle of the night. As for the prisoners themselves, she had that terrific magical quality, which I can't describe, but they also realized that here was a most sincere person and a very practical one who would get on with the job and who had brought help to them after those three and a half years of captivity. Together, whenever that was possible, the Mountbattens would visit the camps where men waited for repatriation, their deepest desire. The compassion of Lord and Lady Louis was visible. Their sympathy was utterly practical. Their impact was unforgettable. It was hard to think what to say to these men. Sometimes, seeing the condition they were in, I could hardly say anything at all. They certainly didn't want to be bothered with formal inspections and a lot of rhetoric. So quite often I'd just gather them round me and tell them what had been happening and what was going on. After all, they'd been cut off from all civilization for years and they needed to be put back in touch with things, as much as they needed medicine and food. Anyway, they seemed to appreciate this. I hope they did. When you first met her, whether you were a general or a private, she had an immediate and lasting impact from the warmness of her personality. She had not only the ability and the organizing power and the energy of an absolutely outstanding man, but she combined with it the sympathy, the understanding, and the compassion of a woman. There was nothing of stage management, nothing of an act. 
It was just someone speaking in spite of exhaustion, hardship and danger, and Lady Louis suffered many of these, someone speaking directly from their own heart. She never left the ward of a hospital or a prison camp without leaving every man in it feeling a surge again of his will to survival. I am sure that Edwina saved countless lives by her tireless personal activity. And although I'm speaking about my own wife, I must add that I consider it was a heroic effort. Each day, Mountbatten discovered more of his grim legacy from the Japanese. In 1942, when Japan completed her vast conquests in Southeast Asia and the Pacific, she called these conquered lands the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. This was the beginning, she proclaimed, of a new ordinary nation. In fact, co-prosperity had meant something very different. The march of Japan had meant destruction. Destruction of natural resources, destruction of productive capacity. Destruction of communications and with them trade and people's livings. Destruction of shrines and monuments, death and wounds for the civilian populations. Japan's conquests were lands in ruin. Co-prosperity meant poverty, sickness, subjection and fear. The new order had not brought independence, but had greatly increased the desire for it. When Japan collapsed, Asian nationalism surged into new life. But for the time being, this could only mean added disorder. It's very difficult to convey the impact of all this at the time. The main point is that these conditions amounted to a complete breakdown, and they existed to a greater or lesser extent in every one of the territories for which I was responsible. And they all had to be tackled immediately and simultaneously. I can make a list of the problems and talk about them one by one, but we couldn't deal with them one by one. Everything was happening at once. And the other important thing was that the force at my disposal, upon which our whole position in Southeast Asia ultimately rested, was steadily getting weaker. British units were being systematically demobilized. <laughs> they asked for nothing better than to get home. Indian forces, by far the largest component in SIAC, couldn't be used indefinitely to implement British policy, of which Indian opinion often disapproved, so the time factor was all important. We had to do many things, all at once, and very fast. Singapore itself, seat of Mountbatten SEAC headquarters, was in a restless mood in 1945. Its population divided and disturbed. Coming back here to Singapore to make this television series in 1967, not very long after another grave emergency in this region, I can see a lot of changes. In particular, of course, this island of Singapore is now independent of the mainland of Malaya. In 1945, both came under my military administration, and our problems here then were political and racial. There were five million people in this area at that time. 43% of them Chinese, 41% Malays, and a large number of Indians. The Japanese have been playing one community off against another, and the Chinese have been the chief sufferers. The Chinese, with their strong commercial instincts, were the wealthiest community. They were also the most politically conscious and the best organized. It was they who had taken the lead in the resistance to the Japanese, but the most effective section of the Chinese resistance had undoubtedly been the Communist Party which regarded the expulsion of the Japanese as only a stage towards the expulsion of the British. So we could expect trouble, and we got it. Here in Singapore, the showdown came in January and February 1946. The communists tried to subvert the administration by strikes and mass demonstrations. They failed. The administration stood firm, which I think surprised them. 
but it was a very unpleasant situation and I had to take some difficult decisions. My policy here was on the same lines as it had been in Burma. I had to restore order, but I was against anything that looked like oppression by the British. I was determined to err, if I erred, on the side of leniency. I was criticized for this. I probably still am. Some people, including some of my senior officers, thought I was being too lenient. Well, the subsequent history of the area has not been an entirely happy one. All I can say is that while I was responsible, what I was trying to do was to promote goodwill and not ill will, and I'd do the same thing again. Bangkok, 1967. The capital of Thailand, once better known as Siam. Commercialized, modernized, westernized, but preserving, like crystallized dreams, the monuments of a legendary past. The monarchy itself is such a relic, dating from the 18th century, but still a powerful force in a country which clings to tradition, while the modern ideologies of East and West fight bitterly across the borders. The Siamese monarchy owes something to Mountbatten, in 1945, Siam was technically an enemy. Her territory had been necessary to the Japanese as a strategic springboard. Her rice crop had been necessary to uphold the myth of co-prosperity. In 1941, Japanese forces landed. Siamese resistance was slight, and soon the country was under Japanese domination. In 1942, the Japanese forced Siam to declare war on Britain and America. When this technical state of war ended in January 1946, Mountbatten went to Bangkok to attend the peace celebrations. The young king of Siam, brother of the present ruler, reviewed the great parade. Mountbatten had pressed for the retention of the monarchy, believing that this institution was the best means of preserving stability. His friendship with the Siamese royal house dates from this occasion. In 1945-46, the Siamese fell over themselves to be friendly and hospitable to our troops and to wipe out the unfortunate memory of having been technically at war with us. But unfortunately, all was not plain sailing in our relations with the Siamese government at that time. Under Japanese occupation, Food production all over Southeast Asia had declined. Above all rice, which was the staple food, starvation was an imminent threat. And there is no sharper spur to revolution than starvation. Siam was the largest rice producer in Southeast Asia. We needed Siam's rice supplies very badly. But it took quite a while to get an adequate flow going again into the starving areas outside Siam. In all the countries of Mountbatten's vast domain, angry nationalism, spurred by hunger, became a formidable force to reckon with. Each day, each week, threw up new problems. The French and Dutch territories were our worst headache by far. They presented a double problem. First, we were pledged to hand back their overseas possessions to our French and Dutch allies without really knowing what their policies for these areas were going to be or how these areas were going to receive them. There was always the disagreeable possibility that SEAC forces might be involved in backing up attitudes and policies which were contrary to the Atlantic Charter. And secondly, neither the French nor the Dutch had the resources available to take over themselves immediately. So there was a power vacuum in which communism, nationalist extremism, and sheer brigandage flourished. In French Indochina, containing the states now known as Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, the power vacuum produced a situation of complex danger. 
1945, the Japanese had overthrown the last vestiges of Vichy French authority. Now there was a contest for power. The French tried to reassert themselves, but their forces were very weak. The nationalist leader was Ho Chi Minh, who had set up the Viet Minh, the League for the Independence of Vietnam, in exile in China in 1941. Now Ho Chi Minh had returned to end French rule. Ho Chi Minh was known to be a communist, but he received American backing as an anti-colonialist. The British felt obliged to support their French allies and at least keep order until French policy clarified. A further complication was China under Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, who also had a stake in Vietnam. I went there as a correspondent in September 1945 and in Saigon, the capital, I saw the beginnings of all the trouble that went on for so many, many years afterwards. First the French War, then much later the American War, none of which need have happened if Mountbatten's advice had been taken at the time. The original error was made at Potsdam when they decided to carve French Indochina in half horizontally at the 16th parallel and give the northern part to Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, who was then thought to represent China. This was utterly stupid. Vietnam, as Mountbatten knew, ought to have been, and ought always to be, one territory. The Vietnamese never particularly liked the Chinese. Ho Chi Minh, with whom, no doubt, Mountbatten would have negotiated in accordance with his principle of negotiating with the genuine nationalist resistance leaders, he might have been the, the Tito of Southeast Asia. He would much rather have been independent of Peking, whether it was under Chiang or even under the communists. And I'm quite sure that if only the French government at home had not been so intransigent, so obstinate and slow to move out, all the trouble could have been averted. It must have been heartbreaking for Mountbatten to be in command militarily, in a sense, and yet to have to leave the essential political decisions to other nations. It was heartbreaking, because one could see tragedy building up all the time. Yet I couldn't leave French Indochina to anarchy, which is what seemed to be the most likely thing in 1945. I sent in our troops under General Gracie, who took a firm grip on the situation straight away, and try to calm things down. This cost us quite a few casualties, I'm afraid. But after a time, three French troops arrived with up-to-date equipment and commanded by their famous general, Leclerc. Bit by bit, they took over from us, for which I was thankful. Vietnam was now their problem. Even so, the division of the country along the 16th parallel, decreed at Potsdam, was already revealed as a disaster which the whole world was to suffer for so many years. So the wars in Vietnam really owed their origin to this mistake in 1945. We couldn't see that far into the future at the time. To us, the Dutch East Indies seemed to be a much worse problem. To the Dutch East Indies, Japan had brought promises of independence and a little more. The Dutch had begun their rule over this empire of 3,000 islands in the 16th century. Their form of colonialism had been oppressive. Dr. Ahmed Sukarno, the nationalist leader, was interned and released from Dutch imprisonment by the Japanese. Under his leadership, Japan set up an Indonesian Central Advisory Council to prepare for independence. The Japanese gave the Indonesians arms and trained them as soldiers. One week before they surrendered, they warned Sukarno and advised him that now was his time. On August the 17th, 1945, two days after Japan's surrender, he proclaimed a Republic of Indonesia. By the time Mountbatten's forces and the representatives of the Dutch government arrived in Java, the new Republic had had a month to organize and prepare if necessary to fight. Mountbatten's troops had two objects, to remove the Japanese and to evacuate the many thousands of Allied prisoners of war and the internees, mostly Dutch. 
At once, they found their task complicated by the bitter conflict which developed between the Indonesians and the returning Dutch. The Indonesians began to use the internees as hostages. Conditions in some camps in the interior were bad, but now a new danger arose, massacre, either in the camp or in the course of evacuation. And even when these people reached the safety of British protection, their troubles were not over. For most of them, this meant leaving the East Indies, the end of a way of life, loss of possessions, parting with a country they knew to return to a homeland where they would be strangers. The conflict between colonialism and nationalism became intense. For Mountbatten, the chief consideration was to prevent British and Indian troops being involved on one side or the other. But this was not always possible. Indonesia causes more worry and unhappiness than any other area. At bottom, our troubles were due to lack of information. Neither General MacArthur's intelligence staff nor my own Dutch staff gave me any idea of the strength of the nationalist movement. I suppose they didn't know themselves. Edwina was really the first person to give me an inkling of what was going on. Everything that I had done my best to avoid in the British territories, Malaya and Burma, seemed to happen in Indonesia. Every attitude seemed to be displayed in its worst aspect. There were horrible mutilations and massacres and ugly deeds on both sides. Neither the British nor the Indian troops liked the difficult and dangerous job they were called on to do. And neither did I. We had over 2,000 British and Indian casualties in Indonesia in one of the most thankless tasks our troops have ever had to carry out. It was really sickening. Not until July 1946 was the British task in Indonesia completed. British strength in Southeast Asia was now steadily running down as the British and Indian forces returned to their homes and the demobilization they had earned so well. Civil administrations were taking over throughout the SEAC area. The Special Commissioner for Southeast Asia, appointed at my request, Lord Killern, arrived in Singapore in March. He immediately became very much involved in the food problem, which was still acute, because there was a world food shortage at that time. In that month, we had another important arrival, Pandit Nehru the most distinguished figure in the Indian interim government, came to Singapore to study the conditions of the large Indian community and meet the Indian forces there. It would be hard to think of a more fateful meeting. He could easily have gone terribly wrong. Nehru had just been in prison for opposing our war effort. One of the things he was supposed to do was to lay a wreath on the memorial to the Indian National Army who had fought against us. In fact, his whole visit could have developed into a vast anti-British demonstration. Not very nice to think about when you consider that the bulk of our forces here were Indians. Yet, if the original plans made by the local authorities in my absence had been followed, I felt that this is exactly what could have happened. The local authorities wanted to cold shoulder Nero, to hamper his movements, to restrict his contact with the Indian community. I thought that this would be disastrous. This man was clearly going to be Prime Minister of India. How fatal for future Anglo-Indian relations to treat him like that. The local authorities hadn't even arranged to let Nero have a car, so I lent him mine. We brought hundreds of Indians into Singapore in army trucks to see him. I received him immediately at Government House and then drove with him through the streets where he had a fantastic welcome. At the Indian Red Cross Recreation Center, Edwina was waiting to meet him. The enthusiasm inside was so overwhelming that Edwina was knocked over in the rush and Nero and I had to rescue her together. That night, I invited him to dinner with us 
It was a very happy little party. I was able to persuade him not to lay the wreath on the pro-Japanese Indian National Army Memorial. And in fact, his whole nine-day visit passed off very well without any unpleasantness of any description or any disturbance. This really was a stroke of fate. It was the beginning of a deep friendship between Jawaharlal Nehru and Edwina and myself. How important this was going to be, of course, I couldn't possibly guess. But the value of establishing this link was obvious enough. It was not merely valuable as a matter of British policy, it was valuable to Nehru too. It helped to prevent him adopting extreme attitudes which couldn't have failed to make things difficult for him later as Prime Minister. It helped to wipe out the bitterness of the past. But what I value above all is the lasting friendship we formed. The Mountbatten talent for friendship soon found other outlets. A few days after meeting Nehru, Lord and Lady Mountbatten visited Australia and New Zealand at the invitation of the governments of those countries. The purpose of the visit was very similar to that of an earlier occasion, the Prince of Wales' tour in 1920, a goodwill tour, when Mountbatten witnessed the enthusiastic welcome of the Prince. Now he was the recipient of such a welcome, he and Lady Louis, or as one Australian newspaper proclaimed in banner headlines, he's a beaut and she's even more of a beaut. Australians would be slow to forget the work that Lady Louis had done for their prisoners of war in the Japanese camps. A visit in both countries was a triumph. Although I originally came over for the purposes of discussions with the Australian cabinet and the chiefs of staff, the wonderful welcome that my wife and I have had from all the people of Australia has been a very great thrill indeed and something that we shall both remember as long as we live. I, like my husband, have been deeply touched at the really lovely welcome that we've received since we arrived in Australia. And I did welcome the kind invitation of the Commonwealth Government to accompany him on this tour. Particularly so because it's already given me the opportunity of seeing a large number of the prisoners of war whom I met in the Japanese camps during last year. And also doctors and nurses and Red Cross workers who were my colleagues in those bad months in the Far East. But Mountbatten was still Supreme Allied Commander, Southeast Asia. He had business to do with the Australian leaders and his method of doing it impressed them. There were even rumors that he might become Governor General keeping that post in the family by succeeding his cousin, the Duke of Gloucester. But this was not to be. General Salute! Present! Up! His period of command was drawing to an end. In May 1946, the Right Honourable Malcolm MacDonald, also at Mountbatten's request, arrived as Governor General of Malaya and Singapore, and Mountbatten proudly handed over to him a fully functioning administration. When I arrived in Malaya, I soon found that my duties had been greatly eased by the policy which Lord Mountbatten had been pursuing just before. An immense political change had taken place throughout Asia. The local people's acceptance of colonial rule by Western imperial powers uh, was no longer effective and they had a passionate desire to attain national independence for themselves. That movement was, of course, opposed by uh, most of the British and other European people living in those parts at that time. The governors, the provincial commissioners, the generals and the colonels had a sense of what was then called the white man's burden. They thought that we had a destiny to rule Asia in the interests of the Asians themselves. Lord Mountbatten had completely opposed that attitude. He treated with deep sincerity 
all the Asians as absolute equals with ourselves. And he sympathized with their desire for national independence. He encouraged their nationalist movements. Now, the fact that he was the supreme military commander and a man of very great social eminence uh, holding those views, of course, made an impression. And the circumstance that he was a relation of royalty uh, aided the influence which he exerted. And a lot of the Europeans, <laughs> who were snobs, thought, uh -huh, if that is what Lord Mountbatten thinks, perhaps there's something in it. And the fact is, to sum up, that Mountbatten played a very great part in starting the process of transition from colonialism to independence throughout Asia uh, by peaceful processes. And the fact that the process in the British territories uh, continued in a peaceful, constitutional and friendly way throughout the continent is owing in distinct measure to Louis Mountbatten's leadership. For Mountbatten, in the second half of 1946, the time came when the returning warrior receives his due reward. The one who had done so much, the rewards were many. In London's historic Guildhall, he was presented with a sword of honour and the freedom of the city. The freedom of the city of London is by common consent the greatest civic honour in the British Empire. I am deeply appreciative of its bestowal on me today and the sword of honour, which will be my most treasured possession, shall hang above that sword which was surrendered to me by the Japanese Supreme Commander of the Southern Regions Field Marshal Count Terauchi. From the Guildhall, the Mountbatten's drove in triumph to the Mansion House, where the Supreme Commander had another speech to make. If there are any of my own friends from Southeast Asia down there in the crowd among you, I'd like you to know you ought to be up here on the balcony with me. London's honours were followed by other valued freedoms, by honorary degrees, presidencies of distinguished organisations. Allied countries also added their accolade. At the Invalides in Paris, with full panoply, Mountbatten was invested with the Grand Cross of the Legion of Honour by France's famous fighting soldier, Marshal Juin. In October, the Mountbatten celebrated an event of different gratification, the marriage of their eldest daughter. The Honorable Patricia Mountbatten was 22 years old. Now she married her father's ADC, Sir John Natchville, seventh Baron Braben, whose father had been governor of Bombay and Bengal and temporary viceroy of India for six months in 1938. Once more, a Mountbatten wedding brightened the social scene. Mountbatten himself now had a new title, commemorating the great campaign conducted under him, Mountbatten of Burma. It commemorated also his first passage through the dangerous waters of high politics. Lord Mountbatten in Southeast Asia had two roles, of course, the military uh, and the semi-political for, uh, for a short time. His military campaign was supremely successful. As far as the political situation was concerned, he was faced with some pretty tricky decisions. Burma uh, presented a particular problem, and it was here, I think, that Lord Mountbatten earned some criticism, particularly from the Conservative Party. 
He selected a nationalist, what is more, one who had been a part of the guerrilla war conducted by the Japanese and part of their irregular Burmese army in Burma. He let it be known that if a man had been a traitor, it wouldn't count against him uh, politically. And so he selected Aung San to conduct the independence negotiations with the British government. Some of the critics will say that um, he failed because Burma left the Commonwealth. I would be inclined to think that uh, he was supported in his Southeast Asia policies by the great majority of people uh, in this country, although the Burmese one was undoubtedly one which did um, lead, to, uh, lead to criticism. We in Burma are very pleased that Lord Louis Mountbatten is given the title of Mountbatten of Burma because of his successful campaign in our country. And we are doubly pleased because we found in him a man that understood our national aspirations. Quite frankly speaking, we were not very sure that we will get our independence so quickly after the return of the British. But when we come into contact with Mount Batten of Burma, we are confident and we are convinced that we will get what we wanted. Because in him, we found a man with great foresight. And I'm glad that walking with him, we, the Burmese in Burma and the British parted as friends. Mountbatten never pretended that he did not relish honours. Now a secret ambition was fulfilled. The king conferred upon him the most coveted award of all. With ancient ceremony, Mountbatten became a knight of the Order of the Garter, his banner hanging in illustrious company in St. George's Chapel, Windsor. It was wonderful to be home again. It was wonderful to be honoured in all these ways. I've always got an enormous kick out of such things. I know every commander says that his honours are as much a tribute to his men as to himself. But in my case, that was true in a special way. My men had had to go on fighting when their comrades in Europe had stopped and then carry on even further into what should have been peace. To carry on like that, after a war, risking their lives all over again, a long way from home, for obscure causes, was a much harder thing than even fighting the war itself. I'm not very good at philosophizing. It's not a thing I normally do. Yet, obviously, the policies I believed in must have sprung from a philosophy of life. I was quite sure in 1945 there was no good fighting against the new tide of Asian nationalism. That the thing to do was to try to make the nationalists our friends. This was easier for me than for some, because I liked many of them personally, and their countries. Nevertheless, much as I'd come to love the East, it was with a sense of relief that I handed over this responsibility and came home. I was just on 46 years old. I was still in the Royal Navy, I'd just been promoted from substantive captain to rear admiral, and I very badly wanted to get back to sea. <laughs> 